Right, D. Make yourself comfortable for this one, kids, because we're going on quite a deep dive into quite a lot of Dragon Age history slash lore. So, you know, D, as it turns out, is quite, an, uh, quite a lot of uh, big topics under D. So, to start with, we begin with Dumart, Dragons and Darkspawn. I am lumping three in together because they all kind of connect to each other in uh, some sort of way. Yes, this is a bit of a follow-on from our Corypheus entry last time because uh, piecing things together a little bit in the Dragon Age world here. So, Dumat was the most powerful of the old gods and the first archdemon to rise during the first blight. So, let's stop a minute and backtrack just a little bit. We need a little quick lesson on what the old gods were. So, what were the old gods? Well, short answer, I'm buggered if I bloody know, love. <laughs> Not a flipping clue. <laughs> That's the short answer. Long answer, slightly longer answer, uh, around 300 years after humans first appeared in Thedas. So this is after the fall of Alathan, right? This is after the elven kingdom fell and the elves became mortal and all of that nonsense, and then humans turned up. So around 300 years after humans appeared in Thedas, they came from the north. We don't really know where they came from or why. We just know they came from the north. But 300 years after they appeared in Thedas, the old gods began whispering to human dreamers. Dreamers being mages who are particularly sensitive to demons and spirits and whatnot. So legend has it that the old gods taught the dreamers magic, right? So they became like the first human mages. And the dreamers then became leaders and priests because they had magic and everybody was like, ah, you can do exciting things, we're gonna follow you. And uh, this is sort of how Tevinter came about. That's, that's kind of, you know, that's the legend. So the old gods who had been whispering to these human dreamers and teaching them magic were then brought through the veil by the dreamers and took the form of dragons who the humans then began worshipping, right? So this is way, way, way back in the very early days of humans, before Ferelden and all lay and all of that nonsense. Humans are very tribal at this point, and this is kind of how the Tevinter Imperium rose, because humans got magic from the old gods. Bearing in mind, this is, this is legend. This is like, we don't know this is exactly how it happened. This is just like the stories. Interestingly, these humans who are worshipping old gods who are dragons, uh, or who at least look like dragons, they didn't actually think that these dragon gods had created the world, right? They credited that to the Maker, or at least a Maker-like deity. I don't think they called him the Maker. I think it was like... I don't think... It, I'm not sure anybody called him the Maker until Andraste came along, actually, and sort of went, oh, it's the Maker. But they did believe that, like, the world had been created by some sort of, you know, deity. They just didn't want to worship him. They wanted to worship dragons instead because dragons are cooler, presumably. So this still doesn't really tell us what the old gods were. The Chantry teaches that the gods were actually spirits or demons. Um, the Maker turned his back on the spirits and the demons, right? This is what the Chantry says, uh, in favour of humans. And then um, the spirits and the demons became jealous. So some of them started whispering to humans to convince them that they were actually the true gods. And the Maker was so enraged by this that he locked the old gods away beneath the earth and turned his back on humanity, hence why everybody thinks he's left them, because, oh, they started worshipping the old gods, blah, 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 blah. So, I realise I have probably given you more questions than answers at this point, but that is what researching Dragon Age lore is like, <laughs> right? <laughs> the actual truth of all of this, in good old Dragon Age style, is very hazy. So what I can tell you, there really are dragons, and they really are locked away beneath the earth, because they are the archdemons, right? So every time there's a blight, it's because the Darkspawn have found an archdemon who are all locked away and asleep in little prisons beneath the earth, right? The Darkspawn can hear the archdemons, they can hear the call of the archdemons, and they're driven to seek them out. So they go seek out an archdemon, find an archdemon, tunnel in, release the archdemon, the archdemon rises, the Darkspawn unite under that particular archdemon, and then there's a blight, right? So there really are super powerful dragons that are locked away and rise as archdemons every time a dog, the, the darkspawn find them. Now, as for what the hell these dragons are or were, or how they actually ended up locked away under the ground, who the hell knows? There is one codex entry that where uh, Brother Genetivi hypothesizes that they may have just been a very powerful breed of dragon. 
um, possibly even sentient and able to talk. And I mean, that's not unusual in fantasy worlds. Fantasy worlds do love their talking dragons. I don't know, there's, there's something there's something going on with dragons in Dragon Age. Like, I am absolutely convinced that there's something going on with dragons. Something more than just, oh, it's a fantasy world, so we need dragons. Because for centuries, dragons were thought to be extinct, right? And then all of a sudden, they reappeared at the start of the Dragon Age, hence the name. And now, they're not even that rare. Like, by Inquisition, there's dragons everywhere. Now, in the comic books, we find out that Morrigan's sister, Yvanna, awoke the dragons at the start of the Dragon Age. Um, because they'd been asleep in a temple or something, if I re uh, remember correctly. And she awoke them again and brought them back, but we still don't know why. Like, why did she bring them back? Did Flemeth want her to bring them back? Why would Flemeth want her to bring them back? She also talks to a high dragon in an alien language. An alien language. <laughs> a different language. Which is very, um, House of the Dragon. I like that. They've got a special dragon language. But there's no, like, mention of that anywhere else in the games or anything like that. It's just that comic book. She talks to the, the dragon in a different language. Which is interesting. She also says something that's quite interesting. She says the blood of dragons is the blood of the world. I have literally no idea what that means, but uh, yeah, so that's interesting. There's also an in-game theory mentioned by Iron Bull that the Canari have dragon blood in them because the Canari are sort of genetically engineered, sort of. They come from a race called the Kossith, who we know nothing really about. The only thing we really get from Iron Bull is that he says the Kossith probably don't look much like the Canari, right? And uh, yeah, we know the Canari have been a sort of a little bit genetically engineered. And there's a theory that... Uh, they had dragon's blood mixed in with them, and that's why they've got Holdens, and they're very sort of connected to dragons. Um, there's a fan theory that they're actually elves with dragon's blood in them. I sort of stand by that theory. I think that's the most likely one. I wonder if the Kossith are actually elves. But then I also have a theory that humans were originally elves. I think just maybe... Was everybody just an elf? Maybe... <laughs> Everybody was just originally an elf, maybe. But anyway, yes, if we combine all of that with the fact that the old gods are dragons, I don't know, there's, there's something about dragons. There's something about dragons. And I'm sure it's important that they've come back. Like, there must have been a reason that they were thought to be extinct. And then, like, they came back. It's one of those things that's, like, not mentioned that often, but I feel like it's important. There's a lot of that in Dragon Age. Anyway, we're getting a tiny bit off topic here, right? So if we tie all of this into the Darkspawn and do not, so... The origin story of the Darkspawn is that Dumat whispered to Corypheus and told him to enter the Golden City, right? So this is what the old gods did. They talked to the humans. This is how the humans knew about them. Now, it's not unusual for things in the Fade to talk to mages, right? Demons and spirits and whatever else might be lurking in the Fade, because we do get hints that there's probably more things in the Fade than just spirits and demons, talk to humans or talk to mages. That's quite normal in the Dragon Age world, right? So that's how the humans knew about the old gods, because the old, dogs were t old gods were talking to them. Now, I, I can't quite work out whether they were always imprisoned under the earth. Like, maybe they were already imprisoned when they started talking to humans. Or maybe they got imprisoned later. We do know that while they were imprisoned, they were still talking to humans. But we also know that they're not talking to them now. But the Darkspawn can hear them, so they're talking to the Darkspawn. I don't know. But anyway. So yes, Dumat, the most powerful of the old gods, was whispering to Corypheus and told him to enter the Golden City. Now when he and the other Magisters entered the Golden City, it corrupted the city, turned it black and unleashed the Darkspawn on the world, right? This seems to have been the downfall of the old gods, as they were corrupted by the Blight and became Archdemons. And they now slumber beneath the earth waiting for the Darkspawn to find them, right? Now, there are two in-game theories about Dumat's transformation into an Archdemon. One is that he was just corrupted by the Darkspawn when the Blight was unleashed on the world, you know, from the Golden Sea. The other is that he actually created the Darkspawn. Now, this seems more likely to me. I, I have a theory. I have a theory. Because Archdemons are more than just Blighted Dragons, surely, right? The Darkspawn are called by them, right? Their entire purpose for existing is to seek out the Archdemons. They can hear them, the Archdemons sing to them, the Wardens can hear them as well, right? It's like a song. So they're driven to seek out these Archdemons. When they find one, they unite under them and a blight begins, right? Now, call me crazy, kids, call me crazy. But if these dragon, demon, old god, 
whatever they are, were really locked away underground by someone or something, possibly the Maker, possibly Solus. I have a theory that the old gods are actually the elven forgotten ones, but we'll get to that in the next video. Doing a lot of deep dive on the lore in the next couple of videos, but it's alright, we'll get through it. Could the archdemons, the old gods, the dragons, whatever they are, could they have either created the Darkspawn or deliberately unleashed the Darkspawn, right, to come and rescue them? Maybe the Darkspawn being unleashed on the world wasn't an unintended consequence of humans walking physically in the Fade. Maybe that was what the old gods intended so that the Darkspawn would come and get them out. Is the whole thing just a really long-winded, elaborate rescue plan? <laughs> right? I mean, that seems to make sense, right? You see, it all depends on whether they were locked up before the Darkspawn or whether they were locked up after the Darkspawn. Because if you believe the Chantry tales, I think they were locked up by the Maker after Corypheus entered the Golden City, I think. So... That was like the downfall of the old gods, so Corypheus entered the Golden City, the Golden City turned black, the Darkspawn were unleashed upon the world, the Maker got really annoyed and locked the old gods away, right? But if they were already locked away, because we don't know, it's Dragon Age, it's Dragon Age lore, it's obscure and vague and, you know, complicated and there's 15 million different versions of what might have happened. Because that's, and, you know, and that's deliberate, that's not continuity errors, that's the way they've written it deliberately to be kind of all vague. But if they were already locked away, Right? Let's say they were always locked away. Let's say they were locked away even when they first started whispering to the humans. Right? The Darkspawn... Is the Darkspawn just like a... Is it just a rescue plan? Is it just like, you know... Were they always there? Because I have this other theory that the Darkspawn were actually always in the, the Golden City. That the Golden City was never golden. That it was black. And that uh, when Corypheus... <laughs> Entered the, entered the golden slash black city. He actually just released the dogs, but he didn't create them, he just released them like they were always in there. Anyway, before we go too deep into my bizarre theories, uh, <laughs> focus back on Dumat. So, Dumat was said to be the most powerful of the old gods and is even credited with teaching humans blood magic for the first time. Worth noting that blood magic typically has to be learned from demons, if we can possibly take that as a clue for what the old gods really are, slash were, slash are, slash were, like, who knows. Um, he was known as the Dragon of Silence, and his followers swore an oath of silence. I don't know whether he was called the Dragon of Silence because his followers swore an oath of silence, or whether his followers swore an oath of silence because he was the Dragon of Silence. But his, yes, his, his followers, his acolytes, swore oaths of silence. Apparently Corypheus didn't get that memo, unfortunately. Uh, he was also supposedly responsible for the destruction of the ancient city of Burinda, which mysteriously vanished after they turned away a priest of Dumont uh, on the winter solstice. Uh, yes, he was the first archdemon that the Darkspawn managed to wake up, and he was there for the cause of the First Blight. He was slain several times during the First Blight, before the Wardens figured out how to kill him. And in Inquisition, Corypheus claims that he can no longer hear Dumat, since he awoke and has turned his back on him, because Dumat stopped whispering to him. Which I'm assuming is because Dumat is, like, dead, presumably. Assuming that an archdemon can die. Like, actually probably die and not just, like, get banished into the Fade. Who knows? So to go back to the original question of what were the old gods? Yes, buggered if I know. Not a clue. <sighs> I don't know. They could just have been demons that were possessing dragons. They could have been actual dragons. They could have been demons that took the form of dragons. I don't know. I mean, now they're literally called arch demons, which means really powerful demon. So maybe they really are just demons. But then you've got things like if you complete Morrigan's ritual in Origins, Kieran, her child who is born from the ritual, takes on the soul of the archdemon that you kill. So he has the soul of an old god in him. I mean, what does that tell us? Do demons have souls? I don't know. We do get hints, particularly recently, particularly in like some of the stuff that's uh, coming out in the build up to Veil God, like the uh, Deventer Knight stories and whatnot, we're getting hints that there are other things in the Fade that are sort of demons but more than demons, and sort of spirits but more than spirits. We know the Elven Gods are kicking around. There could be other things kicking around in there, we've got no idea. So yes, I don't know what they were, slash are. All I know is that there are 
arch demons slumbering beneath the earth. Uh, not many left now, though. Is there only like three left, I think? All the others have been slain during blights and whatnot. But yes, anyway, who knows? Shall we move on? Next, the Divine. The Divine is the leader of the Andrastian faith. And there are actually two of them, because there are two Andrastian chantries. So, there's the Orlesian chantry, which we know and love from the games. Uh, well, I say love. <laughs> um, <laughs> the Orlesian chantry rules over basically all of Thedas. And then there's the Imperial Chantry, which operates only in Tevinter, and they both have their own divine. So we'll start with the Orlesian Divine. The Orlesian Divine is always a woman, as are all of the Grand Clerics and Priests, the Revered Mothers, etc. Um, the logic behind this is that Andraste was a woman and the Prophet of the Maker, so all the leaders of her faith should also be women. But also that Mafarath was a man and he betrayed her, and all men are therefore kind of tainted by his betrayal and not considered fit for the priesthood. Um, the Imperial Divine, on the other hand, is always a man, and as far as I can tell, there's no logical reason for that beyond them just wanting to be different from the Orlesians. Just kind of like, do it to piss the Orlesians off. Their Divine is also, as far as I can tell, always a mage. Definitely usually a mage. I think always a mage, because I'm assuming the Divine has to be a Magister. Although we don't know so much about the Imperial Divine, we do know that the current one is a mage, certainly. And the first one was as well. Anyway, needless to say, the two divines do not get on and refuse to recognise each other at all. The Imperial Divine is known as the Black Divine by the Orlesians, while the Orlesian Divine is informally called the White Divine. But you wouldn't say that to our face because, you know, it's not like it's considered a bit sacrilegious to call her that. So how did we end up in this situation? Well, the Orlesians were the first to appoint a divine. Divine Justinia I was appointed by the Emperor of Olay a good 170 years after Andraste's death. Now, the Andrastian church began, weirdly enough, in Tevinta, which you might think is strange because the Tevintas were the ones who executed her. So Archon Hesarion, who was the one who executed Andraste, as she died, he claimed he heard the voice of the Maker and saw the error of his ways. Now. <laughs> I think if the Maker was actually a half-decent god, he would have whispered to him maybe like a split second before he had Andraste executed. But anyway, basically, as Andraste was dying, the Maker spoke to Archon Hesarian, and Archon Hesarian saw the error of his ways. He accepted the Maker as the one true god, and he was like, oh, we should definitely make a church devoted to the woman I've just killed. So Tevinter had actually been trying to organise an Andrastean faith for nearly two centuries, when suddenly Olay rocks up and appoints the Divine to rule over the whole flipping religion, and Tevinter's just a bit like, whoa, hang on a minute, love, you cannot be doing that. <laughs> Back up a second. <laughs> you cannot just rock up now and just go, oh, look, we've appointed somebody to rule the faith that we've been trying to put together for like 170 years. Just back up a little bit. I mean, bearing in mind that Olay was not like the great powerful empire that it is by the games. Like, you know, Olay was kind of nothing. A huge reason for why Olay is so powerful by the games is because of the Orlesian Chantry. Like, the Orlesian Chantry more or less rules the world, right? Orlay also has a lot more land by the time of the games than it did way back then. I mean, you know, we're talking about a time when the humans were still mostly tribal. Like, they were mo it was mostly just the Alamari kind of kicking about. There were lots of different tribes. They weren't very united. Lots of different religions, lots of different gods. They weren't all Andrastian at this point. So Orlay's kind of nothing. Orlay's just this sort of little kind of kingdom in the south of Thedas. So, like, Tevinter is definitely, like, the global power at this point. And frankly, like, what the hell did Olay have to do with anything? Andraste was born and raised in Ferelden. She lived and died in Tevinter. Like, Tevinter claimed themselves to be a sort of blessed holy land because that's where Andraste lived and was executed. Denerim is her supposed birthplace. That's where people go on pilgrimage to. Like, Olay's gotten out to do an outman. I didn't think she was ever even in Olay. So, like... You could kind of understand that they'd be a bit like, eh, hang on a minute, love. What do you think you're doing? Like, no, you can't just be <laughs> appointing somebody to run our flipping religion. Anyway, despite that, Tevinta did kind of put up with it and they rubbed along well enough for a good 300 years. It's not like the divide was immediate, right? They, they were willing to put up with this divine in the south for a good 300 years. The Orlesian lot did take some issue with the fact that Tevinta was allowing men into the priesthood. Uh, but what they really fell out over was magic, of course, because the Chant of Light, which was put together by Justinia I, this is very important, Andraste did not write the Chant of Light. 
that's not a thing. Justinia the First, the first divine who was appointed by the Orlesian Emperor, um, she wrote the Chant of Light, right? And in the Chant of Light, she stated that magic exists to serve man, not to rule over him. Tavinta was more of the opinion that magic served man by ruling over him. Because, you know, they were, they were, that's, ha that, you know, Tavinta's power comes from magic. It comes from the fact that the people with all the magical power are in charge. They can't, they can't really, in order to function under the magic exists to serve man, not rule over him, they would have to overhaul, like, the entire way that their empire worked. And that probably wasn't really an option for them. So, anyway, needless to say, about 300 years after the first divine and after the Chant of Light was written, Divine Joyous II, fabulous name, found out that mages were ruling the Imperial Chantry. Like, there were mages in the priesthood and everything. She wasn't having any of it. They had a monumental falling out and she declared them all heretics. Thus leading to the two chantries separating and the Imperial Chantry appointing the first Imperial or Black divine who was a male mage like surely that was just to piss the Orlesians off right i mean how where come on they were just like oh yeah we're gonna appoint our own divine we're gonna make him a man and a mage what are you gonna bloody do about it love and then <laughs> and then just to really just to really pour salt in the wound right when joyous the second died the imperial divine announced a holiday to celebrate her death <sighs> yeah <laughs> not classy is it that's not classy but that's how Tavinta rolls um yeah they, they he, he announced a holiday to celebrate the uh divine Joyce the second's death and in retaliation Joyce the second's successor Beatrix the first named the next age the black age that'll teach them that'll learn them that'll learn them to Vinters. that'll teach them to disrespect you <laughs> gonna call the next age the black age after you, Mr. Black Divine. So there were four exalted marches during the Black Age, more on them in the next video, um, against the Tevinture Imperium. And the age after the Black Age was named the Exalted Age because of all the exalted marches that had gone on in the Black Age. None of these exalted marches against Tevinter were particularly successful. They were eventually brought to a halt by the Fourth Blight, which kind of ravaged Southern Thedas. Um, and the two chantries became more divided than ever, quite frankly, and they've never really managed to patch things up. Uh, we don't know much about the Imperial Divines from the past, except that they were all men, and like I say, I assume they were all majors. I've got a fun list of notable Orlesian Divines, though, in chronological order. Justinia I was the first Divine, as we've mentioned, often called the Warrior Priest. She was the only female general uh, in the Emperor of Orle's armies, and he decided to make her Divine because Andraste was a, a warrior, and, you know, he kind of thought it was fitting. Um, her given name was Olesa, but she took the name of Justinia in honour of one of Andraste's first disciples. And all of the divine sins have taken a divine name, which is different to, like, their, uh, you know, their given name. Much like monarchs often do, monarchs often take, like, in, in the real world I'm talking about, monarchs often take a, a new name when they become monarch. Or they did back in history. Uh, next, Renata I ordered the exalted march against the elves after the elves attacked Montsimard and then marched on Valroyo. Um... The holy war against the elves lasted for 10 years, after which Renata ordered all cities to build alienages for the elven survivors to live in, on the condition that they converted to the Andrastian faith. And uh, we're going to get a bit more about her in the next episode, because we're, uh, the letter E is going to be our elven episode, uh, you know, fittingly. Uh, Galatea, fabulous name, one of my favourite plays ever written. <laughs> Just putting that out there. Google Galatea. It's a really good play. It was written uh, during Elizabeth I's reign and it was performed in front of Elizabeth I. And it's about two women who fall in love with each other and get married. Galatea was the divine who granted the right of annulment to the Grand Cleric should any circles fall to demonic possession and whatnot. So yes, if a circle is getting a bit out of control and they think the mages are beyond saving, they can invoke the right of annulment. Um, and kill all the mages, and then it was Galatea who uh, came up with that one. Uh, Rosamond, youngest ever divine, elected at age 19. Very popular in erotic art circles, apparently. That's what I know about her. She was just, oh, they were just writing porn about her <laughs> throughout her entire reign. <laughs> um, Theodosia II, right, I'm going to directly quote. Uh, it's the World of Thedas Volume 2, I believe it is. This is, the, this is the only thing we get about Theodosia II, right? The only thing we get, this, this little sentence in the world of 
Thedas, Volume 2. Theodosia II gave birth on the steps of Valrayo's Grand Cathedral in front of a crowd of devout Andrastians. She was removed from her position shortly afterward. That's it. That's all we get. That, that's it. Like, how eh? I want to know what happened. What happened to her? What happened to the kid? Who was the father? What was going on? How eh? Come on, I need to know these things. <laughs> and of course, finally, lovely Justinia V, formerly revered mother Dorothea, who we see assassinated at the beginning of Inquisition, and is succeeded by Divine Victoria, who can be one of three people, depending on the choices made in the game, including Vivienne, who is herself a mage, much like the Imperial Divine. And in my canon, I like to make Vivian the divine. Because I just think, you know, put a mage on the sunburst throne. Why not? Why not? Shake things up a little bit. Right, and that is your lot for today, kids. Um, this video was originally a lot longer. Because I had an entry about the Deep Roads. I had an entry about Dagna. I had an entry about Dorian. I was covering just dwarves in general as well. As well as, like, Dagna and the Deep Roads. Um, but it was going to end up being, like an hour long and the last one was already an hour long and you know what we are so tight for time with getting these videos out because i came up with this idea like under like very short notice and uh it seemed like a good idea at the time of oh i'll do a countdown series and i'll make 26 videos doing like an eight of dragon age that'll be dandy and uh now, <laughs> now that we're actually getting to it <laughs> yeah might have bitten off slightly more than i can chew but it's fine it'll be fine it'll be fine it'll be fine Yes, but I decided to uh, cut out all of that stuff because we've already done two quite deep dives into uh, Dumat and the Divine. But uh, I will do a part two at some point after Veil God comes out. I will do a part two and we'll have like a, a, a Dwarven episode where we'll do the Deep Roads. We'll do Dagna. Um, we'll probably do the Darkspawn as well. We, we covered the history of the Darkspawn in this one, like the origins of the Darkspawn. But uh, the actual like nature of the Darkspawn and the Blight and that sort of thing, I think we'll do that in a a part two to the uh the letter d we'll have a dwarven centric episode next time uh e is our elven centric episode so we're going into elven history a little bit uh tomorrow so i shall see you then my lovelies just some other quick honorable mentions before we go um dreadwolf dreadwolf was an option uh the dalish were an option duncan deep stalkers denerim uh, I've found actually weirdly, I was going to do a, a, a bit on Denerim, and then I found weirdly there's not much to say about Denerim. I assumed Denerim was going to have loads of like hidden lore and backstory to it. Really not. It's it's the capital of Ferelden and the birthplace of Andraste, and that's kind of it. That's about all I can say about Denerim. Uh, Dracon uh, would be another one, the uh, Emperor of Orlais. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot of entries under D, so we'll definitely have a part two today. We might even have a part three. But yes, anyway, uh, I'll see you tomorrow, my dears.